In today's episode, Alex and I dive all into calorie surpluses. So if you've ever wondered, how do I go through a bulk? What makes it successful? How can I see the best results possible? And also what drives the two of us absolutely insane when it comes to a surplus? Then we'll catch you on the inside. We are diving right into things here, and we are talking all about how to properly be in a surplus. And I think the best question to start with is, why would someone want to be in a surplus? For a couple of different reasons. I think that the first one would be to gain muscle tissue. That's going to be the easiest way or, or the most conducive position to be in to add muscle tissue. What's another reason that you have in mind? I think improved performance and not that you can't see results even when you aren't in a surplus. And that's a question we'll be getting to in a little bit. But I think that your performance can improve, especially when you just have that more focus on fueling your body and being fully recovered as well, where I think that recovery place is a big thing because people will diet and go through diets or just stressful times in their life. And being in a diet can make it even more stressful. And so I think it's so great to be able to prioritize recovery. I think it may be actually even more important for us to define exactly what a calorie surplus is. So do you have a definitive definition of what we're working off of? A calorie surplus is when you're eating more calories than your body needs. Now, I think that before we go any further with that, it can be hard to conceptualize the surplus fully, not only of, okay, how many calories does that mean? If my body doesn't need it, then am I just going to gain fat? There's a lot of questions that come with that. But if we're just talking about the energy balance portion of it, when you're at maintenance, you are intaking the same amount of calories that you are burning burning, so to speak. And then when you're in a deficit, then you're taking in less calories than your body needs. And when you're in a surplus, you're taking in more calories than your body needs. Sure. And, and I, I wanted to make that definition because you could look at a surplus as simply eating more calories than you're accustomed to when you're not in a, a stage of like understanding where your nutritional intake is and you're trying to increase your calorie intake to try and find that maintenance. And so I, I wanted to make that very clear for the audience is that a calorie surplus is going to be a surplus of calories above what your actual maintenance is, not what you you know perceive to be what that maintenance is because you haven't been tracking, but because like what the real maintenance is and then the surplus above that. I think that brings up a great question of how do you know if you're in a surplus? Because exactly that of you can be like, well, I, I did a, a calorie calculator and it told me this is where my maintenance is at. So how do I know what puts me in that surplus position or if I'm accurately in a surplus? So it's going to come down to tracking your body weight. I think that that's going to be the easiest indication of change in overall body mass, of course, as well as paying attention to overall satiation. That's going to be a, a big piece of the puzzle. Where are you at following a meal? How are you feeling throughout your day? How is your training performance? How is your sleep? How are you feeling energetically? Those different factors are, are going to play a role, but it is not going to be something where in a singular day, it's like, okay, I know I'm in, well, I guess you could be in a, a calorie surplus or be aware of a calorie surplus for one particular day. But when we're looking at over a time frame of trying to be in a surplus over a month, two months, three months, et cetera, looking at more of the data collection over the week or the month is going to be important for you to understand, are you actually in the calorie surplus? Now, you mentioned being able to look at scale weight, and I think that scale weight is very important in this because, again, you're tracking data to be able to see where things are at. But if the scale weight goes up two or three pounds, should I just be like, okay, that means I'm in a surplus and I'm gaining muscle? The scale is a useful tool, but it is not going to be a one-for-one -one correlation. One pound of the scale weight going up equals one pound of gain. And the degree or the quantity of surplus is obviously going to be an important piece. And what we've noticed from recent research is that a honestly small surplus is going to be useful to Im improving overall training performance, sleep, and, and those different factors. So we don't have to see a massive change in, in scale readings when 
working to put on that muscle tissue. So when we're looking at overall body mass change on a week to week basis, we can have as little as, and this is honestly what I try to have my clients at, and we're going to get into the duration of time that a surplus should be uh, to actually see the muscle gain that we want. But because of that longer duration that we'll dig into, I encourage my clients and things that we're going to be paying attention to is a fourth of a percent, very small percent, or half a percent of body mass increase from a week to week perspective. So for a 200 pound individual, that's going to be a half pound of increase on a week to week basis up to a pound of change. And so if we're seeing these large bumps of like six pounds increasing per month, we probably need to dial things in and say, okay, are we having more flexibility than what we are you know, reporting from a week to week perspective? Or do we need to decrease the overall surplus? Did we overshoot the amount of calories? Because if you put on in that first month of the surplus, let's say you put on six pounds of, of body mass, the amount of that, that is muscle tissue is not going to be near the total of six pounds. So you've added fluid, you've added muscle glycogen, and you've probably added some body fat. And if we're going to have a surplus that's uh, in duration of five, six, seven months in length, we're setting ourselves up for a lot of excess body fat that we did not need to put on the muscle tissue that we're working to add. And so it's really paying attention to how much are we gaining on a week to week or month to month basis. And it doesn't need to be this large number as like this, okay, I gained 40 pounds over this <laughs> surplus. I'm sure that all of it is muscle tissue. Like that's not going to be the case. And you're going to have to work to pull all that off. So the more conservative you can be in the weight gain that you're experiencing, the better off you're probably going to be, especially if that limited weight gain is not hindering your training performance or it's hindering your sleep or sex hormone production, so on and so forth. Yeah, I think it's a, a balance between of, of course, there's going to be moments of being uncomfortable as you are in a surplus, um, but it's balancing where your body image is and then also of what success you want to see. Because if you are in a place of like, okay, I have to barely gain any weight ever, you're probably shooting yourself in the foot of being like, I have to be so conservative so I see no fat gain. And you still might see good muscle gain, but it might be over two years versus a shorter time frame if you would have allowed the scale weight to go up a little bit. So it's a balancing act. And I think it's hard, especially for someone who's not a coach or doesn't have experience with it to know, hey, am I adding too much body fat? Is the scale going up good or bad? Where does this need to be at? And a common question that I get is if one pound per week is good for a bulk. And I've heard that a ton. And not to say that one pound is bad, exactly especially in your example of a 200 pound man of that's going to be 0.5 to one pounds adding on per week. But if you're a 120 pound female, then that might be something where that looks very differently when it comes down to the math. So I think being able to take that into account, as well as being able to take into account the full picture, including your own pictures of your progress pictures of how they look. And that's something that you have personally helped me with a ton when it comes to myself and to my clients is really being able to look, compare, and see the progress photos so you can say, hey, we're seeing some inflammation here. That's why it looks like this. Or we're seeing some great muscle glycogen here. Or we are seeing muscle gain here. Or there is a little bit of fat here, but that's a little bit of part of it as we go towards gaining that muscle. It's also important to take into consideration of how flexible you're wanting to be yes. in the surplus. Like if you're wanting to have a situation where you're tracking 75% of your day and then you're having one meal that's untracked that you've got kind of free range on, you're probably going to add a little bit more body fat than the person who's going to track the entire time. And if you're okay with that, and it allows for you to be in the surplus for a longer duration of time because the flexibility allows for you to adhere better, 
then that's the trade-off. Like you just have to understand the trade-offs that are in place for the goals that you have. Putting yourself in unrealistic expectations of, well, I want to add 20 pounds of muscle over the next six months. I'm going to do it naturally. <laughs> and I'm going to sometimes track, not all the time. And I want to be able to like go out with my friends on the weekends and get drinks and and stay out late. And it's like, what do you, what do you, you are in a total fantasy world like that doesn't exist. <laughs> I'd love to go there. If exactly. It does exist. <laughs> like it, you can't have your cake and eat it too, or whatever the, the phrase is. Like you've got to be able to understand the different trade-offs that come into place and, and understand that those trade-offs may improve your overall adherence, which is going to be important. And you've got to be okay with some of the cons that may come with the trade-off. Yeah. And I, I think that in those situations, I always try to vocalize to clients of it's not that you can't do these things. It's just that you have to know what the trade-off is so that you're making an informed decision about what you want. Because if you are wanting to see the most growth possible, then staying on a plan is going to be the best way to go about that. But I love what you mentioned there about being able to be consistent with it, because I think that's a huge part of a surplus is the consistency because someone might be like, well, I was in a surplus for a week, but then I didn't feel great about myself. So then I went into a diet for a week or is that maintenance? And they kind of flip flop back and forth or it's like they don't eat, then they go out with friends and they eat and they're like, well, it all evens out to be a surplus. And it's like the consistency really matters, but consistency can look different. Consistency doesn't mean the same thing for each person in each situation. It's being able to look at that, seeing what's gonna make me the most happy, what's gonna be the most enjoyable for me? And what are my goals? And can I mesh those together? Maybe I can't, but if I can, I want to figure out how I can make that happen and then set those expectations for myself instead of being upset because I just didn't understand what I was saying yes to while also saying no to something else. Right. And I think that competitors, bikini competitors, just bodybuilding competitors in general, have a, this is where I have probably the most conversations on this topic because they're going to have the greatest degree of, of changes between a surplus and a deficit because of the sport that they've chosen the to be in. Extremity of it. Ex right. Extremity? <laughs> I don't know if that's a word. <laughs> but with those competitors, they'll come to me saying, I want to be 100% accurate through my surplus. And then two weeks later, they'll be like, I want to go out on dates with my with my boyfriend. I want to be able to go out on dates with my husband. It's like, that can work, but you are now changing how you wanted to go about this. Literally 14 days ago, you said you wanted to be 100% accurate and track everything and be perfect within the surplus to have as much muscle gain as humanly possible. And now you're changing your mind. And that is one of the biggest things. If you take nothing away from this surplus episode, and it's just this aspect of commit, make a decision and commit over the period of time that you have decided to be in the surplus. That is the, the biggest thing because it holds so many people back because they want to have the surplus. They're in it for a month and then they're like, oh my gosh, I'm gaining a little bit more fat than I wanted to. And instead of evaluating of like, maybe my surplus is too great or maybe I'm being too flexible. Instead, they're like, diet. <laughs> time for me to die. I've got to pull this body fat off. Mini cut time. Let's be super <laughs> aggressive cut. for two to four oh weeks. Oh my gosh. Okay. Now I'm back in the surplus and then they're surplus for another two months. Too much body fat, mini cut. And then the six months, eight months goes by. Time for me to get back in prep. It's like, you didn't make any progress. <laughs> yeah. You were dieting the entire time. You never got your cycle back. You have all these things that you never address because you are afraid of being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And if you are wanting to add muscle tissue, if you're wanting to lose body fat, you're going to have seasons of being uncomfortable and you've got to be able to be in that and be okay with it. And especially in the surplus, I would say that the surplus is probably even more challenging than, than the deficit. I would definitely say so. Because it's a longer duration of time. It's not like your clothes aren't fitting you better as they <laughs> are in the deficit. And with dieting, like you can see a result on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week basis where within muscle growth, you can't see it on a day-to-day -day and you can possibly see it on a week-to-week, -week, but not the same way no. when it comes to a diet. Like I, and we've even done it with the Leaner Together series of like, you can see some wild results in 12 weeks with dieting, but 12 weeks with a surplus, it's a lot more difficult to see that same type of results. And if 
we were to do a surplus series for YouTube. <laughs> It'd be like 12 and, months. Exactly. <laughs> if, we, if we were uploading photos every week, you guys would be like, what are what we even results? looking at? <laughs> um, unsubscribe. I'm not going to watch another video. This is stupid. <laughs> like unless we were showing you pictures of maybe month to month, even bi-monthly, that's where you're going to see visual change. And that takes a lot of commitment. I mean, you're, th you're 30 days, 60 days of being very diligent with an intake, with your training, with your sleep and all those different factors, the same diligency that you would need to take to a deficit, but you're not getting the daily payoff of, oh, the scale's going down. Oh, my clothes are fitting better. I'm, I, I am liking the way that I'm looking more. Like you may have more days of poor body image in a surplus that are just kind of part of the territory and you've got to be okay with that. And it's a, it's a reminder and an opportunity to build a better relationship with your body in that time frame, especially if you are so honed in on like, I have always wanted to be smaller. I've always worked to be smaller. And so having that emotional connection, working away from that in a surplus is a, you know, byproduct that's such a valuable achievement or improvement to your mental health from just allowing yourself to eat more calories. Yeah, and just seeing that there's other goals to go towards than just being small. But you mentioned competitors, and I think that's a good segue into another question that we get is, uh, why is it that bodybuilders or competitors can eat so much food and not get fat? Well, <laughs> you know, there are some things that could be helpful here. I think that the biggest one when you're looking at competitors is going to be performance enhancing drugs. That's going to be the easiest way for those individuals to be able to eat more food and maintain a, a relative level of leanness, especially to the individual who is not in the bodybuilding world. And so that's going to be the largest difference. Also, their adherence may be better than what you're familiar with. Like you're always going to be looking at it from a lens of your own experience. And so if you've gone into a surplus and have not had the best adherence, you've had more flexibility, and now you've associated with, well, this large fat gain that came with this surplus, and then you see someone else who's not doing it that way, it's like, what did I do wrong? It's like, yeah. I don't know. There's a list of things you did wrong, <laughs> but you're not associating anything wrong. You're just associating the surplus. Mm -hmm. And so it, it also is going to be coming from, you know, what the lens is for you in particular. And so, you know, those two things would be the big rocks to me. Is there anything that you would highlight? I, I definitely want to re-highlight the adherence, but it's also like they're on a very structured plan with a very specific goal. And even if you as a lifestyle person are in a place where you're like, well, I have, a, I have a goal and it's very specific and I want to reach it. Again, for sustainability and for consistency, I'm going to, I'm not even going to assume, I'm going to tell you for a fact, you have more flexibility. Like I have competed and I competed for seven or eight years in a row of like actively that being my goal. And it was something that every aspect was controlled. And so Obviously, I was in more control of how my scale weight was going and how I was looking than I am when I have more flexibility because I had so many things tracked that I didn't have tracked or I'm not tracking now. And so I think that that's so important as well as just the time period that they've done it where if you have more muscle mass on you, you're going to be able to eat more food. And I think people often overlook that where they are just like, well, I want to reverse diet and get my food up. You can, but also understand that to be able to continue to eat more food, you have to have more muscle on your body for it to be in a place that you're looking the way that you want to. Absolutely. According to a recent survey, 71% of women said they want to increase their glute size. And I get it because I was a part of that 71% until I got my hands on the PD Glute Program. It is a 16-week program, but we have the first four weeks available for free. And just in case you don't believe us, you don't have to just take my word for it. Take Nicole's word, who said this 12-week program is unreal. I'm a trainer myself, but holy shit. This glute program is a mind blown emoji. I have never felt my glutes engage this much. Or take Kenzie's word for it, who said, the workout has been challenging but straightforward, which is great. I have always loved training legs, but never had a clear plan, so this has been very beneficial. I've seen a noticeable difference in my glutes and legs. It's kind of crazy how well it's been working. 
So head to the show notes below to access the first four weeks of the PD Glute program for free and get results like Nicole, Kenzie, and the thousands of others who have said the same. But I think that leads to another great question of will you gain fat when you do go into a calorie surplus? You're going to gain fat. It's going to be no fat. Then (laughs) I should probably just not do it because like fat is bad. Wait, that's the other thing (laughs) is that most people, when the surplus is is presented to them of like, if you're wanting to gain muscle, this is probably going to be a useful tool for you. It's like, well, I'm not as lean as I would like to be now, so I need to diet. And then they just want to chronically diet until they have this perceived level of leanness that they have gotten to. And then they want to get into the surplus. It's like, you're probably not going to reach that level of leanness that you think you need to have. And to be honest with you, the best thing for you at this time is to actually have a controlled environment of eating in a slight surplus. It doesn't have to be, as I talked about, it doesn't have to be 20%, 25% above your maintenance intake. That's a lot of extra food. Mm -hmm. And it's not going, like, if you go into a very large surplus, the duration of time that you're going to be able to sustain that surplus is not very long. Your appetite's going to shrink your digestion is going to slow down. You're going to feel lethargic. You're probably going to want to do less and start to be more tired and not moving as much. It's it's just not going to be a recipe for overall success unless you've been in the trenches before and can like weather the storm, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so for a majority, especially lifestyle clients of mine, I am not going to push much past like five to 7% above their maintenance. One, because the excess weight gain, we're going to have to pull off anyway. Mm -hmm. And what we're monitoring is going to be their training performance, their sleep, their sex hormone production, all these different things to ensure that we're seeing the progress that they desire to have. And by going above that in terms of the quantity of that surplus, we're probably going to see greater fat gain. Do they have maybe a little bit more enjoyment because they have more flexibility because of the higher calories? Possibly. And that enjoyment may allow for them to have greater overall adherence for a longer duration of time. And so then again, that trade-off may be worth it to them to have to work to pull that body fat off in the future. But again, understanding those trade-offs is paramount for you if you're very worried about the fat gain that you're potentially going to have during the surplus, not even potentially, the fat gain that you are going to see in the surplus, you've got to be understanding and not putting yourself in this weird world of expectations that just don't exist with what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So it's like fat is going to be gained, but you can also minimize the amount of fat that is gained. And I think people, again, overlook that where there's like, oh, it's bulk in season. I'm just going to eat whatever I want. And the weight that's on the scale, it's just whatever because it's bulking season. But you really can minimize. And again, more food doesn't always mean more muscle gained. And so like in the interim situation of like, oh, if I am in a 300 calorie surplus, if I'm in a 600 calorie surplus, I'm going to gain double the muscle. Like it's not tit for tat in that. And so you can minimize the amount of fat gain. And that comes down to like you, your training performance is going to be a huge aspect of that, as well as the other factors of progress that you are tracking. But when you are in that surplus, the way that you can minimize it is prioritizing protein, nailing your training performance, and truly recovering from what you're doing. And so if you have those things set up, up, you're going to be able to, as w- as long as you also have the right amount of surplus, you're going to be able to minimize that fat gain and be able to see mostly muscle gain. And I think that once you are able to even view your photos the correct way, where I think that that's another thing is you're so used to seeing yourself, you have a hard time truly looking at your photos and being able to compare them and see the differences because you're maybe just picking out things that you like or don't like about yourself. But really being able to see them and make decisions off of that and data-driven decisions of not just, again, I feel a little fat, I'm going to go ahead and go into a mini cut. It's like stay the course, assess what is not going right, and make a change if it needs to make a change. And that's the way that you're going to have the least amount of fat gain. Well, I would say you left one out. This is probably the most important thing when it comes to minimizing fat gain in a surplus. And that is structuring your freaking meals. 
Yes. Too, too many people mm-hmm. find themselves in a situation where they're like, well, I'm I'm not that hungry right now, so I'm going to keep pushing off my meal. And then it's going to get to noon. It's like, oh, I've got I've got to eat now and I'm starving. Well, I, I have so many calories to eat today. I'll just have whatever I can possibly shove in my mouth for lunch and then well exceed their satiation level. And now they're like, oh my gosh, I've got to unbutton my pants. I can't even think about moving. I need to take a nap. <laughs> and then they sleep and then they're up again at five o'clock. Now we're finally to meal two. They're having their third meal at, at 10 o'clock at night and being like, well, I've got, I'm, I'm still need to get in 1500 calories. And I also need to go to bed in 30 minutes, but (laughs) I'm going to shovel as much food into my mouth and then try to go to sleep. And then they just continue to repeat that cycle. And they're like, why am I gaining so much? Why am I gaining weight? Why do I feel so terrible? Blah, 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 blah. It's because you don't have structure to your meal, dude. Like it's literally that simple. And it takes so much of the, the mental burden of your food off of the plate. Like Trying to track your day as the day goes on and just like play macro Tetris is exhausting. Mm -hmm. And it is one, so annoying, and two, increases food focus so much. I can't tell you the amount of clients who have come to me and been like, I can't stop thinking about food. I am all, all day long, all I do is think about food. When's my next meal? And as soon as we get a structure in place and I'm like, just have the meals ready, the night before, have it all put into your tracking app. And they do that and consistently do that over time. All of a sudden, their food focus is gone because they're no longer just worried about what is my next meal? Mm -hmm. When am I gonna eat again? What's gonna be the most delicious thing? And they're just constantly evaluating and weighing what what would be the best thing? Can I even, do I have the, the, the ingredients for that meal? Do I have this? Do I have that? It's like, just have a plan, dude. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna feel so much better and be in much greater accordance with what your goal actually is. It's frustrating. (laughs) Yes, and the the plan part in general, I think people definitely think they need a plan for a deficit, but when it comes to a surplus, it feels like a lot more of just laissez-faire, of do whatever as long as I'm in a surplus. And it's like you still have to plan and be very intentional in a surplus to see the results that you want which I think leads to another really good question or two questions is asking what is a successful bulk or what does that look like as well as what is a healthy bulk or surplus? So the successful bulk is going to come down to what your goal was. Were you, I I would assume that majority of the individuals listening, your goal is to gain muscle tissue. And so when we look at the physique photos from the start of your surplus to the conclusion of your surplus, what do we see? And this is, a very important piece of taking consistent physique photos, wearing very similar or the same clothing with the same backdrop, with the same lighting, so that those photos are actually useful for you to look at. Because when, if you are, let's say, having uh, physique photos in, in particular clothing because you feel comfortable in them at that time and then you get to the end of the surplus, well, I feel a little bit more comfortable in these clothes and the lighting is changing and the backdrop's changing and you don't have like the camera set to the same position. It's a little bit more in front of you or a little bit more behind you. Then the comparison of those photos, the value decreases because it's like, well, what we could, maybe what's happening here is that you did add tissue, but because of the angle of the camera, because of where it's at and how you're standing and the time of day, it's like, "Eh, maybe not. Yeah. And so the more just status quo, you can make every single one of those photos week in and week out, the more valuable they become because you can actually see real progress. And this is also where your measurements come into play. And so taking body measurements during a surplus is extremely important. And I say this through a deficit as well, but the scale readings are useful. The measurements are even more useful. And then the physique photos are even greater useful if you are able to keep the consistency. And if you have all three, it's even, I mean, it's, I mean, game over. Exactly. Over and over. Over and over. (laughs) I think like for me, again, it very much so depends on what the goal was, but what successful bulk would mean that when I diet next, that I don't just look the same that I did the previous time. And I think so many people, people have had that experience. And honestly, I have multiple clients popping up in my head where they were so scared to go into a surplus because the last time they went into a surplus, they mainly just gained fat. 
dieting was harder, then they end up looking the same that they did the time before. And I can so understand if that was my experience that I'd be like, why would I want to go into a bulk? But I think that it is so powerful to see the way you go about it and having that plan and being very clear on what your goal is and what your intent is, is going to save you so much time and frustration. I think another thing is going to be improved relationship with food Mm -hmm. as well as improved body image. Yeah. Like this is a a time for you to really dig deep internally to better understand how you're viewing yourself, how you're talking to yourself when you're putting on clothes, when you're getting ready to to go out and, and being able to recognize different things for yourself and falling more in love with yourself, falling more in love with your body because of what it's capable of and, and being grateful for the ability to nourish your body in a surplus. Like I think that that's a very powerful thing that can come from a successful um, surplus. So there's a, also mental health things that can be introduced or or, or valued from a, um, being in a surplus. A hundred percent. I think that that is all extremely valid. And going into a healthy surplus, I will say that I don't I don't love the term healthy. And the reason is is I feel like people now use it as such a buzzword. It's like healthy nacho recipe, healthy burgers, and it's like. Okay, doesn't mean that the other ones are necessarily unhealthy. This but might by just saying be healthy, it would now, insinuate. Yeah, now it's insinuating you shouldn't eat this other kind. It's right. this, and I I understand in the concept of it, like that's how people define things. So I'm more okay of being aware personally of like they're just using this as a defining word that they know a lot of people know. But I think that again, it turns into a buzzword of then going black and white of this is good for you. This is bad for you. This is healthy. This is not healthy. And there are definitely things that are not healthy to do. But I think the term healthy can look very different for different people, especially in different phases of their life. So when we received this question, I read it as, so if you're the person who asked this question, then let me know if you meant it in a different way. But I read it in of like a dirty bulk versus like a clean bulk. And if you're listening to this, I'm using air quotes as I say both of those terms. Um, So within that, that also leads to another question, which does it matter what you eat when you are in a surplus? And I'm going to go ahead and answer both of these combined. Yes, it does matter what you eat. Obviously, the surplus overall matters, but next up matters your protein amount uh, because that's going to very much so determine like the macro breakdown is going to determine what type of results that you see overall. But I am such a proponent for food quality making such a big difference on how a bulk or a surplus goes. I agree. And I've, I have been notorious for saying this exact point, And I continue to die on this hill is that digestion is the most important part of muscle building because within muscle building or being in a calorie surplus, it is going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time. And often the thing that really holds people back is the consistency of hitting that higher calorie allotment. And oftentimes that's going to be held back by their appetite as well as their digestion. And so if we cannot manage digestion, all of it kind of crumbles because if we don't have the adequate nutrients in place, we're not going to have the training performance and and it's just a, a snowball effect. And so the quality of the nutrients that you're consuming are tremendously important. Um, I, and I would also say from a food relationship, continuing to push towards quality and and having more whole foods in your diet and having a more complete overall plate every time that you sit down is a good idea. It's mm-hmm. it's a good thing to push towards that on a a, a meal to meal basis and and navigating away, especially looking at a dirty bulk, having meals that are like an entire box of cereal and a container of ice cream. <laughs> Although fun, (laughs) although probably delicious overall, not the best from a micronutrient perspective, you're going to get your calories in, but also not that great from like a food relationship perspective. Like those things can be consumed, fair game, but they need to probably be in a little bit more of a moderation of of intake and a part of your daily intake, not a full meal. Mm -hmm. And so looking at it in that way, I think is the, the best way to continue to have that quality of relationship. Because as I've, you know, now getting into year 10 of coaching, 
their my perspective on these things. And and when I first started coaching, you can go back to our old, old YouTube videos. <laughs> my full day of eatings were ridiculous. <laughs> Candy. On I had candy. to fight to get calories in. And so I was constantly eating candy. I was constantly having ice cream. I was constantly having cereal. And again, these things are not bad by themselves, but the quantity of those things, I could have had a much better approach to my intake and had um, prioritized my digestion, prioritized how I felt. Because I can assure you, after having all of the sugar that I had, I didn't feel super great. And I would be bloated, I would be uncomfortable, but I was like, I'm trying to get this amount of calories in, this is the only way that I'm aware of, of doing it. And now as I've, you know, this much experience that I've had, there are better ways of going about it. And so the quality of foods tremendously matters um, as you're navigating through a surplus. You just didn't have your sous chef. This is true. <laughs> I was making my own food and that's probably the the problem because my food tasted terrible. Oh, and um, I mean, do we have any examples we'd like to share with everyone? Oh, of, I don't know if we want to make people throw up while they're listening <laughs> to this. I, I literally was so committed to just the numbers. Like I was, all I cared about was macros. It did not matter the quality of, uh, I don't know if necessarily, yeah, I guess the quality of food yeah. didn't necessarily matter, but also the taste of the food didn't matter. Like the chicken that I baked, nothing on it. I just ate it. <laughs> the salmon that I baked, nothing on it, just ate it. I mean, everything that I did, I did not have much seasoning or preparation or even thought that went into it. Is It was more of like, is this edible? What are the macros? Sounds good. That was literally the checklist. <laughs> oh my gosh. but. I know that this is probably not the thought that you're thinking of, but I do have to share because it still makes me laugh to this day of the turkey burgers <laughs> where Alex would go and get these turkey burgers like from the grocery store. And so to him, he thought it was just like ground turkey put into a patty. Come to find out years later, he was tracking it as just the ground turkey put into a patty. And he was like, these are incredible <laughs> turkey burgers. I've never They're had turkey burgers <laughs> that taste so good. And it's just turkey. <laughs> Come to find out later, it's like infused with mayo and all this other stuff. Yeah, I was tracking it like maybe four grams of fat for this entire burger. And it was uh, so good. It was, they were fire, as you can imagine. They were actually 30 grams of fat and I would have two at a time. Oh my goodness. Um, so I was a little over on my food those days, unbeknownst to me. And I had them every single week because they would go on sale at, what was the place called? Um, it wasn't Schnucks, Not was Whole it? Foods. No, it's not, it was like... Um, it was like a Whole Foods place. <laughs> and I think that they went on sale because the turkey was going bad. Mm -hmm. Like it was, they were on the tail end and that's why they had to infuse it with mayo. So it looked edible, I suppose. Oh my gosh. Um, it was like green pet. It was like infused with green peppers and, and mayo. And yeah, so they were actually come to find out they were 30 grams of fat and the same amount of protein that I was putting in. So at least I was hitting my protein. You were, you were. Um, well, we're getting down to the last few questions here that we got. Uh, so this one is, can you still build muscle in a calorie deficit? You can. Uh, recent research is actually supporting this, which is great. Um, the, the things that are the most important when it comes to adding muscle tissue in a deficit is going to come down to your training intensity, your ability to recover from that training intensity, the protein consumption that you have and making sure that that is adequate for overall recovery and the quality of your sleep. Obviously, sex hormone um, health is going to be important here as well, but it is possible. Is it the best environment to put on muscle tissue? No. Having a, an energy surplus is going to be the best environment to maximize recovery, training performance, all the things we've talked about. But you can add muscle tissue in a calorie deficit, which is which is awesome. Yeah. And I, I've noticed it myself that it definitely is possible, but it's also looking at what do you want to optimize, where it might be possible, but how much of each am I getting when I'm trying to balance that? Now, of course, there's newbie gains. So if you're brand new to the gym or if you've had an extended time away from the gym, then you can have newbie gains, which are basically you're gaining muscle and losing fat at the same time, which is awesome. And I mentioned that because we're talking about a calorie deficit in this specific question, but it's definitely possible. It's just looking at what is the most optimal for the type of results that I'm wanting to see. Yeah. And just being honest with yourself of what you want to see as with anything in life, if you are splitting your attention to two different things, you're gonna get kind of like middle of the road, maybe a little bit above average results with each. 
And it's like, if you're okay with having those type of results at the conclusion of whatever this phase is looking like for you, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, what have you, okay. But also, if we were to have just the goal of a calorie surplus and adding muscle tissue for that 16 weeks, we're probably going to see better results. And are you okay with un uh, knowing that you could have gone about this differently if your main goal is to add muscle tissue? And if that's the case, then awesome. But if you're also on the flip side, if you're wanting to lose body fat, I would just go into the deficit and, you know, push yourself hard in that you can, and this data is really just showcasing like the ability to retain that muscle tissue is very high. And if the, the DEXA scans and those different things are presenting that you lost muscle tissue, it's probably just the muscle glycogen that was lost and the fluids that were lost, not necessarily that you lost muscle density. That's a whole other topic. But. <laughs> are you sick and tired of your glutes not growing? turning around in the mirror and seeing a board for a booty. I've been coaching for nearly a decade, helping thousands of women reach their goals. The most common goal, grow my glutes. Women in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and even 60s, able to grow their glutes with the guidance of my training programs. And for all this time, I've kept my best glute growth secrets only for my one-on-one -on -one clients. And that changes today. We just released our 12-week glute growth program in the PD training app. It is a four-day program with exercise and volume adjustments every three weeks. You can easily access the program through our app and track every single workout. Each exercise will have a detailed video teaching you exactly how to perform each and every movement. And guess what? I am no longer gatekeeping. I'm sharing every single one of my best glute growth secrets inside this program because you are awesome and I want you to have this program. I'm going to give you $25 off, making it a fraction of what you spent at Starbucks this past month. Use code POD. The link to purchase will be in the description. Now let's get back to the show. Now, this next question, I want to define this a little bit before I get into it. Um, but the question is, how long or sorry, do you need to be in a surplus to get stronger? Can you be can you get stronger without being in a surplus? And the reason I want to make a little asterisk here is the last question was about building muscle. And I think that a lot of times people think that building muscle and getting stronger go hand in hand. And they can go hand in hand, but they are not necessarily the same thing of you can get stronger without building muscle and you can build muscle without adding extensive strength. Sure. You want to expand on that? I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on that. What do you mean? Well, I, I would just say for the vast majority of individuals that the two are going to be, are going to coexist. They, they are, co they do coexist. Yeah. But I just wanted to say like the question wasn't exactly the same and they are different goals. Like you can have the goal to get stronger and you can get stronger and also build muscle and you can have the goal to build muscle. And again, you can also get stronger, but it's not that they are the exact same goal. Sure. I think that if your goal is to be a power lifter and work in a rep range of one to three repetitions or one to up to five repetitions, and you're living in that range, the likelihood of you gaining hypertrophy and increasing muscle density is not as strong as if your overarching goal was to build muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. So in that context, yes, strength and, and hypertrophy are going to kind of be separate. But for the vast majority of people, I, I don't want people to okay, I agree with you. lose sight of yeah. like the bigger picture here is that more often than not, you're getting stronger. You're probably adding muscle tissue if you have a well-balanced training program that is going to go across multiple different rep ranges, adequate training volume. Yes, I agree with you. Okay. <laughs> so do you need to be in a surplus to get stronger? I don't think so. I, I would say that the biggest thing there, as we've talked about throughout this entire thing, and, and getting stronger in a training phase without being in a, a calorie surplus, it just becomes more and more important of having a quality training protocol. Like mm -hmm. the structure of the training becomes much more important if we're going to limit one of the resources that we're going to have. And so when we look at the resources that are going to be contributing, the sleep, the nutrients, the uh, supplementation, those different things, like if we're going to limit one of those, we've got to get more and more specific with the structure and the things that we have within our control. And so if you have someone who's just like, trying to figure out how to write training programs, and you're also trying to maximize the results for your strength, but also be in a calorie deficit, it's probably not going to be the best situation. But if you have a real expert in program design, 
and someone who is collecting the data and, and taking things week to week and structuring a customized training protocol for you to get stronger in a calorie deficit, 100% it can happen. Yeah, I've hit a lot of PRs and preps. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times people think, okay, if I am not eating all of this food, I still can't train hard. And I think training intensity, again, like I mentioned, is so, so important when it comes to a bulk or surplus of any kind. So I will have a video linked below that I went through what it looks like for training intensity and training to failure, because I've even had some of my clients watch it and they said that it helped unlock some things for them to really push themselves in the gym. And I can't emphasize that enough that like your training intensity and the execution of the training is going to yield you the most results. Do you have any other questions? I do. I have two more. Are okay. you ready? Yeah. I have one that I'm surprised we haven't touched on yet, but I'm going to let you hit the okay. these two. Can you lose weight in a calorie surplus? No. <laughs> <laughs> then you're not in a calorie surplus. <laughs> yes. Now, now, I think that weight on the scale is important for us to kind of talk through. Mm -hmm. So can you see the scale go down when you're in a calorie surplus? Yes. Yes. What would be happening is that you would be losing inflammation. You may be in a position where you've underconsumed nutrients or you have been in a overtrained state for an extended period of time and you have finally increased your calories above maintenance and we have enough resources to actually recover. We lose that inflammation. We feel better. Our energy is better. And now we're in a position where we've lost scale weight, but it's not because we've lost body fat, but it's because the fluid has flushed from our system. That's going to be the change. Now, another thing that could be happening is that you would be getting into a surplus for the first time in your life. All of a sudden you have energy. All of a sudden you're like, I am bouncing off the walls and want to do everything humanly possible. You're cleaning up more around the house. You're doing laundry. You're doing dishes. You're doing all these things. You're going on walks and, and doing all the activity, you're now all of a sudden, you went from 6,000 steps to 15,000 steps because I have mm -hmm. all this energy. And it's like, because I got into a calorie surplus, I'm losing weight. It's like, no, no, no. A calorie maintenance, a calorie surplus, a calorie deficit is moving on a gradient. And so whatever your output is, is going to change what that target actually is. And so if you were in a surplus for the activity level of 6,000 steps training three days a week, and then you increase the calories to be in that surplus at that particular activity level. And because of that increase in overall nutrients, you get to 15 K steps. Now you're training four days a week and you're training even harder during that time frame. You're sleeping better because of those increase in nutrients. That surplus may not be a surplus any longer. It may be a deficit. You know, it, it's one of those things where the change in activity plays a massive role. And it's not because you got into a surplus and now you're losing body fat. It's because you got into the surplus from your previous activity level and you got more active and now it's a deficit. Yeah, I had to put down of like, it might be what you think is a surplus, but you're not actually in a surplus. But scale weight can vary whether you're in a deficit or a surplus. I've been in a deficit before and my scale weight has gone up. That doesn't mean that I've gained body fat or that I'm now in a surplus. It's that the scale weight can vary for a multitude of reasons. And like I could go through each and everything that could change your scale weight, but we're looking at the trends overall. And so if it's trending in the direction we want it to, that's what we want to look at instead of just, well, from Tuesday to Wednesday, the scale weight went down two pounds. So now I need to increase food. It's like you might need to increase food, but let's get a little bit more data. Let's see where things are trending overall and let's see what needs to be changed there. Yeah, absolutely. So the question that I think a lot of people want to know is how long do you have to be in a surplus to gain muscle? The minimum amount of time to be in a surplus is 12 to 16 weeks. I do not think unless enhancements are in place. So we're talking about the natural individual. I think that the minimum amount is going to be three months or, or 12 weeks. And I think that that is a really good starting point also to look at photos to see a real change in body composition, muscular density, those different factors. And if you're able to sustain consistency to a calorie surplus for 90 days, 12 weeks, that should be an, that's honestly an accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Like that is something that you should celebrate just as you would celebrate if you were able to be in a calorie deficit for those 90 days. And so being mindful of that and kind of using that as your first checkpoint of where are we at with my goal? Have I reached my goal? Well, how is my digestion? 
How is my training performance? How am I feeling? Where's my mentality? Let's try to push it for another four to eight weeks. Now we're at 16 or 20 weeks in duration. How do those physique photos look? And really, you can push it as long as you would like to with training performance being um, looked at and making sure that that's in a good place. Yeah, yeah, the periodized within the training uh, program design, uh, making sure that your sleep's in a good spot, making sure that um, blood panels are in a good position, all these different factors. Really, the surplus can go as long as you need it to be. And I I can use myself as an example here. I was in a, a true surplus for two years. Now, there was undulization to this. We had times in which we pulled back on food. We had times where food escalated up. But in the total two years, I was in a surplus. And it was the best thing for my body composition. I added the most muscle tissue I had ever had. That's crazy. You added the most muscle tissue when you focused on adding muscle tissue? It's crazy. Wow. That that really like puts things in perspective for me. Now, was I uncomfortable in that time frame? No. Y- yes. <laughs> Did I have really bad body image days? Yes. Did I struggle with my own, like how my clothes fit? Did I struggle with changing the, like I had to buy a size up and these different things. And appetite being lowered. All these different things I struggled with throughout it, but I knew what my overarching goal was. And I was paying attention to those, that particular thing of, am I getting 1% closer to my goal? Yes, that's all that matters. All the emotional stuff, it is what it is. And that's, it's, it's fleeting, those emotions. And I know that I have the tools and the knowledge to change all these emotions. I can get myself into a better position, but it also is important for me to be more okay with, like, this is what I'm working to do. And I need to be okay with what my body is is doing right now and appreciate what it's capable of doing at this time as well. And so um, time duration, 12 to 16 weeks at a minimum. You're not going to have a surplus for four weeks and all of a sudden add four pounds of muscle tissue. (laughs) Like if you are in a surplus for 12 to 16 weeks, a pound to a pound and a half at most two pounds would be an amazing feat when we look at real added muscle tissue. Now, the differences of of a scale reading higher than that are going to be that muscle glycogen is going to elevate as well. And when we pull carbohydrates into the muscle belly, water is going to come with it. And so scale weight wise, you may see more than one to two pounds of increase to the scale, but in the grand scheme of real muscle density being added, that's what the number is probably going to be closer to be. Yeah. And I think there are, there are a few factors that like can change this time frame. So uh, your genetics, there are people that just are genetic outliers and can gain muscle really quickly and look insane but that is the exception, not the rule, Uh, as well as your training age can play into it um, and your training intensity, your consistency, your nutrition, things that we've already mentioned. But there are things that can contribute to that like anything, but being able to really look at what the rule or what the general aspect is, is that it's going to be at least that 12 to 16 weeks. But I honestly really prefer for people to be in a surplus if they're a client of mine for at least that six months, especially depending on the type of goal that they have. That's always going to be the leading thing of do we have a certain timeline we have to stick to and do we have a certain goal and how can we mesh that together? But I find that for a lot of my clients of they'll go that 12 weeks and then they're antsy to like lose weight, which I completely understand and validate. But I always try to challenge and be like, hey, you wanted to see this type of change in your body. We've, we're have we in that direction for sure. Do you think that you can commit to this for another 12 weeks to really see what we can do here with giving yourself time of committing to the process and going all in on it? The more flexibility that you want to have, the longer duration you're going to have to go to have a similar result. So like the, if you are 100% on top of everything, that's the shortest window of time that you could add the muscle tissue that you want. But the more flexibility, the more variance, the more life things that come about, that duration of time is going to have to expand and you're going to have to be okay with that. Like life is going to happen. Things are going to happen. And so giving yourself more time than what you think is probably a good idea. Are there any other things you want to add, especially from like your personal experience and or anecdotal of working with so many clients and leading them through a bulk or a surplus? I think having a timetable is huge. Like it's not just this, 
I'm starting a surplus and then it's just forever. Like having checkpoints and making sure that you are on the right path is tremendously important. I feel terrible for the clients who come to me after a year of working with someone else and they're like, I was in a bulk the entire time and they send me photos and I'm like, oh my gosh, you look the exact same. Like, what was the issue? Training performance, the periodization of the program design, you weren't actually in a surplus. Like, what was the deal? Like, there's something that was off and there should have been, this should have been identified after the first three months, if not the first month of this. You shouldn't have gone for a full year. And I feel terrible because, I mean, I would hate to waste that much time, mm-hmm. like, especially if your goal is to make change and, and create um, body composition improvements to you. And then you spend an entire year doing what you thought was doing that. And then you get to it and it's like, damn, I look the exact same. I'll tell you, the person who's done that is very unwilling to make that mistake again. Yeah. Um, so just be unwilling before you make the mistake. <laughs> like listen here and do the right thing. The second thing is going to be don't make it a free-for-all. Mm-hmm. The free-for-all is going to be the biggest detriment for you because you're not going to be able to have the duration of time that's necessary because you're going to, you know, the appetite and, and hunger are going to be skewed. But like having a set plan in place is tremendously going to help you maintain also the normalcy to your life. I know in your mind right now, it's like the flexibility is the best thing for me. Like having the structured intake is going to make me like weird to my family and all these different things. It's like in a surplus, you've got extra calories. You're going to be able to go out with your family and still have a general idea of tracking. (laughs) Like you can go out with your family, you can go out with your friends and go out to dinner and go to lunch and still be within your calorie allotment. It may not be the perfect macro breakdown, but you're probably going to be within your calories. And that's still a, you know, thumbs up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to turn into, well, because I went out to eat and I, you know, my, my boyfriend wanted to go out to dinner. I'm just, you know, today's an untracked day. It's like, you don't have to do that. And that's also with planning of like, because you didn't plan. And I know some things come up of like someone surprises you or someone says, hey, do you want to go grab food when you weren't planning on it? But having a plan that you can then pivot from is so freaking important because if you're going through your day and you're like, oh, I know I'm going to be going out to eat, but I'm in a surplus. So it doesn't really matter. I'm just getting extra calories. Then that's when you are going to pack on the pounds that you don't want to pack on. And that's something like I'm so understanding standing up. Like, I don't want to gain excess weight that I don't have to, because like you said, I'm going to have to take it off in a diet. I'm going to feel uncomfortable and all these different things. So any way I can still have flexibility, but again, show up for myself. That's one small thing that you can do is make a plan so that you can show up for your goals. You can show up for yourself. You can show up for your future self and what you want to happen. And you're keeping the promises you made to yourself, which all add to you feeling better about yourself Instead of feeling like shit because you're like, well, I'm I'm in a surplus or I'm in a bulk, so it doesn't matter. It's like it does matter. It's very, very important for the goal you say is important to you. Exactly. Yeah, I would say those things. And I, I feel like I could go on for days. <laughs> um, I would say also, don't complain. Like you are you are opting to eat in a surplus of calories of what your body needs. How ridiculous do you sound of like, oh my gosh, this is so hard. I can't believe that I'm having to eat all of this food. Oh my gosh, woe is me. I'm going to have to go to Instagram and say, guys, (laughs) this 3,000 calories a day is just too much. Can someone come and eat the carbs for me? (laughs) Like I despise that. I'll also say of like, I know we kind of already touched on this, but like, don't just try to add food to look impressive for how much food you are eating. Like that is such a pet peeve of mine of being like, I'm eating 400 carbs now. It's like, congrats. I can tell like (laughs) you gained fat and like your coach is still moving up food and you're sitting here bragging about how much you're eating when like you're not seeing the results that like you're saying you want to see. Yeah. So like, I feel like, and I even got into this like bad, like I'm not sitting here saying like holier than now. I have a hundred percent and with past coaches, like been very in the place where it's like, I just want to get my food higher and higher to say that my food's higher to say I got to this in my off season. And it's like, 
throw away the conceptions you have of food or what your friend is eating and what's a lot for your friend and think about, am I satiated? Am I eating foods that I enjoy? Am I in a place where I'm hungry for my foods? Like, look at the bigger picture here instead of being so wrapped up in like, well, last time I only got to this amount and I really want to go for like 400, 500 carbs this time. It's like, what benefit is that giving you other than just telling people you're eating that much food? Amen. It's a great one to end on. (laughs) Well, if you guys have any other questions, then if you're watching this on YouTube, then please leave them below. But hopefully this was helpful in you figuring out what it looks like to go through a bulk or to be in a surplus because we know it can be very confusing. And if you do want some help along the way, we got a team to help you out so we can get you on a free call to be able to chat about what your goals are. And all of that will be linked below as well. So share this with a friend that you also want to get mad gains. And we'll catch you in the next one.